bless football, Mikey A. God bless football, Mike Golick. God bless football, everyone, because football has started. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Less than 50 days away. Uh, and people are already asking questions. Would you be more surprised? And I'm going to ask the same question of Kyle Rudolph when he comes on with us. Would you be more surprised if the Mike, first off, step one, Aaron Rodgers reported to camp. He did so on time. That's a positive right. sign for the Jets. Okay. Yep. He lied and said he gets very excited every time he drives down Jets Drive. No one does. In the history no. of in the history of the New York Jets at football, no one has been excited driving down Jets Drive. But questions are being asked. Would you be more surprised if the Jets make it to the Super Bowl or miss the playoffs? And I will ask your friend, my friend, Mike Gola Jr.'s friend, Kyle Rudolph, coming up here. Uh, in just a few minutes, uh, Kyle Rudolph, one of the very few who did worse than you did at Lake Tahoe, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stu, let me tell you, I had so much fun uh, there, but man, the first yeah. two days I was awful. And you were you were on the bag for the first nine holes on the first day, so you witnessed it. You were probably right on T number one when I got introduced to hand me the putter off the tee box because I would have hit it better than I hit my drive. Right. Uh, it was very frustrating. Very, very frustrating. I played really well, well, comparative to what I, how I had played on Sunday, the last day. So if I were to get invited back, I, I look forward to improving my score because it was not so good. I was After the second day, I'm like, please, God, don't let me finish last in this thing. You know, before we were just talking off air and Mike said, I asked him how he's doing and he said he's tired, you know, from all the golfing and whatnot. And I just said, you know, that's nothing compared to the pain I have in my wrist from scrolling down the leaderboard, the scorecard to try and find Mike Golick's name on the scoreboard. I mean, I was scrolling for days and I couldn't find you. Shut up, Mikey. Eh? I don't need to hear that. <laughs> Billy's not here. I gotta. I gotta take a little bit of that. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it was you know as like the first day again. It's the modified stable for scoring system. So you want to be in plus numbers, not minus. No, or, or yeah, plus numbers, not minus numbers. Yes. You want to be in the in the red, not in the black. And I was fourteen plus fourteen the first day. Or mine, I don't know how, but no, in the you, were, bad. you were minus minus fourteen, yeah. minus the eighteen. 14. The second, I, and I said, okay, I'm going to improve the second day. I was worse. I went to minus eighteen, and then the third day I was minus eight. It was my best day, and I said, okay, so if I get invited back, my goal next year will be be in single digits all three days because Stu and Mikey, a, I have never driven the ball worse than I did those first two days. I was. I was absolutely putting myself behind the eight ball on every single hole the first two days. And then I finally was hitting it better off the tee on the last day. And that's when I was in single digits. So that's the goal for next year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mike, I'll get to the driver in a second because you are very stubborn. You stick with the driver, even though I was trying to tell you to hit putter or five yeah. wood or three wood or any other club in your bag. Cause the driver wasn't working that day. We'll get to me caddying in just a second, but it just dawned on me that people not in the know, you could kind of walk around saying, hey, check it out. I was minus 40 at a golf tournament. I mean, how about that? If they have no idea what's going on, they're going to think how good I was, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, absolutely. You went 14 under one round? <laughs> yeah, that's how good I am. That's my game, baby. That is where my game is. Oh, my Good God. enough for 84th place. Yeah. Is that what it was? 84th? Yeah. 84th. Yeah. Mike, oh, is there a guy who finished ahead of you that brings you the most amount of shame? If you'd like me to read some of the names, I'm happy to do it. Well, I mean, listen, you always go into this thinking that, you know, say, well, I should be able to beat Charles Barkley. Right. But so I ran into Charles at Harrah's where we were staying. And before the first day, this was after the Pro-Am on Thursday. So it was before the first round. Mm -hmm. And I said, Charles, and we, we were just chit-chatting. And then I started asking about the tournament. I said, my biggest fear is, I rarely play consecutive days, and this was four consecutive days, including the program pro am. And I said I never walk, and this was three consecutive days of walking. He said, "Dude, I was sixty-five pounds heavier last year. By the end of Saturday and all of Sunday, he said I was dead, and I was double bogeying like crazy, and I felt awful. 
He looks great. He lost 65 pounds this past year, and his golf game has improved. I think he was in the 20s, I think, maybe the 30s, but he definitely definitely beat me. Uh, but but he said that was a key thing for him. And, and then preparing, walking, he said, I'd walk like 27 holes as I was practicing, and I didn't do any of that. My wife kept saying, you got to go walk. You got to yeah. walk, and I, and I never did. Uh, so, you know, I made a lot of rookie mistakes. You'll learn. You'll improve next year. Mike, you're going to be invited back. You know that, right? Like, once I, you're there, you're there. That's it. Hopefully, you know, um, Mike, could, because, by back. the way. Mike, I am telling you, you're invited back. Like, you had no idea. Mike, you're a big deal. I'm going to tell the audience right now that when you showed up, like, I was having a conversation with Miles Teller, who is a young man, who I spent some time with at the Dead Show on Sunday night, by the way. But Miles Teller, okay, the second he saw you, he shoved me aside and he spent 40 minutes with you because he has watched you his entire life. He loves the Eagles. He loves Notre Dame football. Mike, you're a big deal out there. And and, and I, I have a hard time seeing that, Stu. You know, you know, man, we've talked about this. I I don't get 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 that, you know. I don't I don't really believe that at times. It was it was somewhat amazing that some of these stars were coming up and talking about oh man i, I listen to you all the time you know and this so that was uh that was pretty cool and for me you know because people said who are you looking forward to meeting and i said you know for the last 25 years when i've been doing sports radio i've had 90 percent of these athletes on so i either know them or have had them on the show and great athletes have never i've never like wow i gotta meet that guy because it was that was my world for so long of playing and then talking about it. For me, it's always been the entertainers, actors, actresses, musicians that that got me going. And, and, and as I told you, you know, first day golfing with Ray Romano, my wife and I every night went to bed watching Everybody Loves Raymond. And I got to meet Ray Romano, his kids following him around there. Ray was phenomenal, you know, and, and so it was Ray Romano and v Ray, Mike Vrabel, who I knew. The second day was Steve Young and Catherine Tapp. And again, I knew them, you know, from the business we had been in. Sure. And then the last day was Miles Teller and Chase Crawford. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, because I watched the boys and Chase Crawford's The Deep on the boys and Miles Teller. You know, I, I have certainly seen his movies and know, know of him extreme a, a lot. So to meet those guys and see how nice they were and just having great conversation and them talking about how they listen to the show or – as you said, Miles got to be a Notre Dame fan because of his dad. His dad was walking inside the ropes. My son Mike was, so those two were chatting. It was very cool. It was a very kind of surreal moment, but a very cool moment. Uh, Mikey A., I have uh, checked out the leaderboard here, all the people who finished in front of Golic. It oh, has God. to be Larry the Cable Guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Larry hits the ball pretty well. I mean, you. I know, and, and I watch him. I, because one one of the whole when we were passing through they were they were teeing off he hits the ball pretty damn well I mean I, I didn't expect that but but there it is I, I I put it on me though Stu again you saw the first nine of it how it was that way was it for two days I could not get off the tee box I will remedy that next year and right. so I I will scramble for pars instead of scrambling for bogeys. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I will be in single digits each of the each of the days. Far as your friend, Mike. That's yes. the deal. Yeah, uh, we actually have some football stuff to talk about, and we will get to it. And Kyle Rudolph's going to join us coming up uh, in just a few minutes. But Mike, if you if you wouldn't mind, give Mikey a and give the the great audience we have here at God Bless Football an honest, true evaluation of me being on your bag of me as your caddy for the nine holes that I did it. I lasted, listen, we hit the over. It was four and a half holes. Yep. I told you I gave you five. I gave you nine. I gave you four bonus holes. But your honest evaluation of how I did as your caddy. I, I, I'm i not going to lie. I was I was stunned at how good you were. I, I felt bad that you were carrying the bag for that long. Now, the, the caddy I had the rest of the time was kind of walking along with us. But you had the bag. You were giving me suggestions. And... You know, I was golfing poorly, and and that and that of course, all kidding aside, it's my fault, not anybody else's fault. And I gotta say, you were, you know, we joke around a lot, and we have a lot of fun. You were very good at at trying to get me to to relax, to yeah. calm down, to to you know, to kind of get myself back into it a little bit. I was somewhat surprised, uh, a that you made it nine holes, and b that you were as 
invested and involved <laughs> as you were. I, I was I, I was somewhat stunned. Time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm on the putting Mike Yeah, I'm on the putting green right before the first tee off. And as the, the real caddy is helping me, uh, the bag is over by Stu and he's just ripping darts at that point. He's just <laughs> he's killing heaters, yeah. you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is gonna be great. great. It's got a nice and a nice pouch for uh for yeah. darts. It yeah. does. I mean, <laughs> I bought one when I got home. <laughs> I absolutely love that Mike is singing the praises of Stu, and Stu is so proud of himself I for know. how he caddied. You yeah. finished in 84th place. How good could he have been? I know, but at the time that I left, he was like in ninth place. I mean, yeah, it was. He was the Mike first EA. to tee off. But Mike EA, it was, it I was, top. It, it was bad. I, I was, I was bad. And normally, and that's the thing that got me is normally I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not good enough to care or to get frustrated. Right. But this was the first time I was at this event. There's a lot of people there, obviously fans, a lot of big names there. And I, I started caring too much, especially when I was hitting bad tee shots. Yes. And that that just then kind of, you know, kind of folded on itself. And I just kept doing it. So I was really mad at myself for for how serious I was taking it. I have to stop doing that. You saw the uh, the lax coach in me. That's what you saw. Yeah, you saw yes. the, Mike, you felt it for a minute there because there was a moment he hit a great eight iron on on a very difficult par three and was inside of Rabel's ball. It was a great shot. You missed the birdie putt, but it was yeah. a great, great shot. A couple of holes later, you have a similar shot. And I said, Mike, positive thoughts, same club, eight iron, like you did a couple of holes ago, and you nailed it again, Mike. And that's what a good caddy does, you know? I don't know if I would say it was like your lacrosse coach because I know you've gotten kicked out of a few tournaments, so I'm not right. sure I'd go down left. that road. Right. <laughs> so, Golik, what me and Mikey A wanted to do is find someone who played golf worse than you did over the weekend. <laughs> There weren't a lot of choices, but we found our guy, and he happens to be a friend of yours and your family, and a very close friend of your son, Mike Golick Jr. It is Kyle Rudolph, who is joining us, by the way, from a golf course because he is committed to getting better at the game he was lousy at over the weekend. Hello, Kyle. <laughs> How are you doing, Stu? You know, it's it's funny. Uh, you know, not often do you know am I able to do stuff for the Golick family? They've done so much for me over the course of my life through my time at Notre Dame and the years in the league. So I just thought, you know, it was, he was a rookie out there at Tahoe and I wanted to make sure that uh, I let him beat me and he felt good about it. Oh, that's so real this nice. Was, this, that's this such a, a nice, this was a gift, huh? <laughs> no. And the other part of it too is I, yes, I'm on a golf course, but no, I'm not practicing. Maybe I should practice. Uh, my four-year-old son is out here with a few other four-year-olds and, I'm I'm dedicating now my life to make sure he doesn't suck at golf as much as I do. <laughs> I I am amazed at four year olds on a golf course, and we were talking before you came on. They're actually hitting out of the sand trap. I I can't even fathom whoever is teaching them that the patience level they have to have with a handful of four year olds in a bunker. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what would be a more impressive feat if uh, Tyler, the assistant pro here, could get my game better or that he can keep four four-year-olds safe for an hour in a bunker <laughs> as balls and sand are just flying everywhere. <laughs> uh, Rudolph, does it piss you off? Like, Because you're a competitive guy. I mean, you're a professional athlete. Um, and Mike, I will ask you the same question. Like, Were you frustrated that so many people finished ahead of you guys? <laughs> You know what? It's funny because the first year I played out there, you know, I tried to practice a little bit leading up to it. I go out in the practice round. I shot an 81. I'm like, gosh, this is – I'm going to score like 10 points tomorrow. This is easy. <laughs> uh, and I go out in the first round and shoot 95. And it was like – I was so frustrated. You know, I'm, I'm a competitor. You know, it's like it, at the core of who I am is competing – and it was like I was pissed off for the entire day in one of the most beautiful places in the world with so many cool other athletes and celebrities and entertainers. And just the whole week is so good that you can't let your competitiveness get in the way. And this year I didn't practice at all. So, of course, I went out and didn't play well. So I got to find the the sweet spot there of caring a little bit and not caring at all. It's It's kind of that forgetting Sarah Marshall analogy. Like, okay, now you're not doing anything at all. Uh, that was me this year. I, I didn't do anything at all. And 
you know, I went out and shot 95 the first day again. So, uh, you know, I, I don't get frustrated because it's not what I do for a living. I don't spend a whole lot of time doing it. I think I would be more frustrated had I practiced a lot and still sucked. It, it, it's amazing. There's almost a diff- difference of 30 years between us. And what he just said, <laughs> I did the same thing. This was my first time. So I practiced before it. And even the pro-am on Thursday, when, when it was a scramble, I shot well, hit it great out of the tee box. I was shooting well. I'm like, okay, my goal was to kind of finish in the middle of the pack. And I sucked the first two days. I couldn't get off the tee box until the third, until the Sunday, the last day. And and normally, just like Rudy said, I don't get frustrated because I know I'm not a PGA guy. I go out there to just have fun. But I was getting really pissed at myself going, I'm not this bad of a golfer. And then it just piles on one another until you get so frustrated. So I'm kind of where Kyle is. I don't know what to – if I get invited back, I don't know – if I should practice more, practice less, take it less serious. But I will say this, while I I did beat Kyle, he did best me in one category. He did break a boat windshield with one of his shots. So, Rudy, what was And made par. And made par. So, uh, it was the 18th, which is the par 5 along the lake. And it's not a really long par 5. Um, But the second shot, the, the bunk, or not the bunker, excuse me, the lake is like, 10 yards right of the green. So it's, it seems crazy. I just thought, oh, okay, well, I hit that one in the lake. Like I'm going to go up and drop. It was my second shot. So now I'll drop three in the drop zone and, you know, see what happens. So I go up, I drop three in the drop zone. And I actually almost hit four in. So I almost made birdie after hitting the water. <laughs> and then as I'm walking up to tap in my par, I hear him yell from the lake, you shattered the windshield. And I like, look, you know, just like, I don't want to really know it was me. So I like look over and it looked like, you know, the spider web when your phone shatters, it's what their windshield looked like. Right. So, you know, I obviously felt bad. Uh, I send my caddy over who was another good friend of the Golic family. and was one of our roommates in college, Braxton cave. And he actually works in the RV and Marine industry. So he's like, what kind is it? And they told him the manufacturer and he goes, okay, I got it. We'll replace it for you. So they went from being kind of like upset that I shattered their windshield to, ah, oh, don't worry about it. Like accidents happen. You got it. Once we told him we would replace it. So <laughs> we're going to make sure that they get a, a brand new windshield on their boat. And I made the par putt. So that was the only day of the three that I made par on 18. And it took going off a boat windshield to do it. Win win for everyone. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny because your your mentality changes uh, when you suck like I do. Um, <laughs> I, I know the only way I'm going to get on TV is if I hit like a, a hero shot. Yep. Right. So yes. you know, you're, you're out in the middle of the, you know, I wasn't in the middle of the fairway, but you're out on the par five and it's like, you know, I could hit this up, lay up, maybe punch out from behind the trees and then, you know, play the hole responsibly or – I could try to hoist this one up over the trees and, you know, they're going to show that on TV because it's the second shot into a par five. So, you know, maybe next time I, I should consider that there are boats parked on the right of the water. And, and when I decide to do my hero shots, choose a little more wisely. It is so true because that's what my caddy would say. You know, we're not getting on TV unless there's that hero shot. So I'm on the last day. I, it's a, a par four. I forgot what hole I stripe a, a drive down the middle and it's that hole where the where the bunker just covers the whole front of the green, and mm-hmm. I and I put it in the bunker, hit it short, and I put it in the bunker, and God knows how, but I hit a bunker shot and it went in. So I I hit the bunker shot, it hit the green, and it's rolling. I'm like, my God, that's going to go in, and it went in. And I was playing with Miles Teller and Chase Crawford. Then they're going nuts. Everybody's going nuts there, and I looked up in the tower, and there was no camera running. Then I'm like. Damn, <laughs> like the one <laughs> shot that maybe could get on TV is not going to get on TV because they hadn't started the broadcast and nobody was up there even taping anything. So I was a little bummed out at that. Mr. Golick, as you get experience, you'll know that the, the TV cameras are always rolling 16, 17, 18, and then seven, the par three where Steph made his hole. Oh, lot. right. Um, so those four holes, the cameras are always rolling. Outside of that, if you're not one of the, the featured groups, they're not following us with the cameras. So from now on, if you're on those holes, yeah, here's the four-year-old. He, he, there he is. Hi, Henry. 
There's Henry. Good hit, buddy. Good job. Nice. <laughs> Those are the four holes. If you're going to hit hero shots, go for like so. On on Saturday, on 16, I hit like a hybrid to about eight feet and had an eagle putt. So that was how I got on TV Saturday. You hit shots like that. And that's only thing that's going to get us guys that are 83rd place on TV. Oh, that's good to know. Good to know going forward. I, I appreciate that info because, uh, yeah, I, I just – my goal next year is to try and – because I went 14, 18, 8. And so I finished really well on Sunday, and my goal next year is to be in single digits each of the days. Now, again, I don't know how to go about it because I suck so bad, so I'm really not yeah, sure. Yeah, you're bad because it all fell apart after I left, Mike. It did. Honest. Stu yeah. did yeah. Uh, uh, caddy my first nine holes, yeah. but I was playing Stu, like I crap then. I would say you made a great decision. Um, you know, caddying nine holes and exiting stage left is the way to do it. Thank you. The caddies don't get enough credit uh, carrying agree. that bag around, especially. So the first year I go out there, you know, I'm I'm so excited. My dad's on my bag. Um, you know, my my dad's not necessarily young anymore, um, and we're just so happy that we're out there. We had watched it on TV so many times. We go two pro ams and then the three days. So he carried my bag five days. By Sunday, he was just basically floating in the lake because he couldn't hardly walk anymore. He's like, I'm just going to go in the cold water and then uh, maybe we'll find somebody else to carry your bag. So I definitely shout out to all the caddies that are out there because lugging that thing around, whether it's three, four, five days in a row, is not easy. I have a newfound respect for caddies. You're right. I really do. It's amazing. It's a job you think you could do until you do it and you realize that you can't. By the way, Kyle will be uh, be calling games for the Big Ten Network for uh, or for the Big Ten for NBC this year. And I see you because normally you'd be getting ready for training camp. And yet here you are now and you seem very, very happy. Big smile on your face. You're spending time with your son. And so I am wondering, I know you won't miss training camp. But do you imagine as the season progresses, as they start playing games, that you're going to miss the thing you did forever? Absolutely. I mean, I, I've played football since I was five years old. Um, you know, I always joked around, like, at some point I'll get to know what August is like for the real world. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't known what August is. I hear it's a great month in the summer, but I have no idea what August is like because I haven't had August since I was five years old. And um I think one of the things that's helping me with the transition is the fact that I'm able to call games for NBC. And I did a couple of games this spring to, to give it a shot, two things, to see if I was any good at it, most importantly, and also to see if I enjoyed it. And I felt like calling the games allowed me to prepare as if I was playing and kind of get that football fix that I knew when I was – it was all said and done and I was finished playing, I wouldn't have any more. So, so obviously you can never, you know, guys say it all the time. Mr. Golick knows this having gone through the transition. You can't replace that locker room, you know, 75 guys hanging out on a daily basis. But there are things I feel like TV allows me to do in terms of getting that fix as opposed to playing football. So, I'm extremely excited that the opportunity NBC gave me to call some Big Ten games this year. Uh, and like I said, it just kind of helps that transition into what's next. Uh, and listen, Kyle, you're 100% correct because I always got asked when I left football what was the hardest part. And I said, if you're not going to something else, if you're just kind of sitting around, then all of a sudden camp starts and the season starts and you're like, I can still do this. You're not doing anything else and you just sit there and, and get all ticked off. Well, you're going into something where you're stay involved in the game. And that that's a huge thing. We can still be around players, still be around the game, still be around coaches, yet you don't have to ice down on Mondays anymore. So and, and by the way, you did a great job. The first thing you did was the Notre Dame spring game and before you did some USFL games. And you did a great job. So you you'll be you'll be you'll be excellent at it. There, there's no concern there, but because you're going right into that, it's going to help you a lot to less of missing the game uh, and just kind of wondering what you're going to do next. Yeah. And I think that played a huge part of it. You know, for me personally, I went into this off season as if any other, just assuming I would keep playing football. Uh, it's just, you know, that's how it kind of is January, February, when the season ends, we lost in the playoffs. And then, you know, as February went to March, 
Uh, actually, we had talked to a few teams in free agency. I got really close to signing with a team in particular. And it was kind of just, for me, I have something that's almost, you know, pulling me out of the game of football. And, you know, I'm so excited about the next chapter, whether it's, you know, with All True, the fundraising platform that we worked with the Golic Family Foundation on, um, you know, broadcasting games. And really it was sitting down with my wife, Jordan, and, and talking about is going and playing football again worth it? Um, you know, missing things like this where, you know, I can bring my son Henry to his golf lesson. Um, you know, I, my kids are six, six, four and almost one and a half. And it's like, yeah, they're six and four. They don't really have any clue, but you know, I asked Henry, I said, Henry, do you want to keep going to dad's games? And he goes, I want you to start coming to my games. And it's like, exactly. Fair enough. Um, so I think, for me, I'm extremely fortunate to have played to a point where physically I feel great. Uh, you know, being able to walk away from the game and have played 12 years and still have my body like I do. Um, but also not feeling like, man, like I feel really good and I, I want to get in a training camp and I just can't. It's more, I'm so excited about what's next and, you know, the next chapter in, in, in the booth and in business that it's kind of when we weighed the pros and cons, it was like, you know, what, what's the point of going for it another year? Stu, it's amazing. His, this is a guy I knew when he was 18 years old, just coming into college, and to now oh, hear him. Golic. It's annoying. I mean, to hear him as such a mature adult, yeah. because believe me, when I first met him <laughs> and all those guys, not so mature adults at 18. None of us are. Wait to a what second, Mike. The last time I spoke to Kyle Rudolph, he was he was preparing his house for something called Beer Olympics with your son, Mike Golick Jr., and Mike Golick Jr. was sleeping in his bed. What? Well, I mean, listen, <laughs> I, I, didn't say, normal. I didn't say I didn't say mature 365, you know, okay? 24-7, 365. But, I mean, you just listen to the mature response here and what he's done with the Children's Hospital in, in Minnesota and now with All True, how he's helped, you know, the Golick Family Foundation and other foundations as well. It's really amazing to, to see where a lot of these guys, and in this case, Kyle, have grown up to because my wife and I were so invested in them as, as young 18-year-olds coming into Notre Dame when sometimes the parents couldn't come in all the time and we had a place there and kind of brought them in as our own it's it's very cool to see it's it's wild too to see a kid that was 18 that we met now with four kids and being a responsible adult but boy he's doing he's working the hell out of it that's for sure <laughs> sometimes sometimes yeah. a responsible adult <laughs> are you still doing the beer olympics by the way you know what uh we lost it during the pandemic but it's definitely something you know, we got to get it back. We always would do it the the day before we would have our golf tournament for the Children's Hospital. So right. um, as we kind of get into normalcy again, it was always hard for me to convince the Children's Hospital to have a beer Olympics to raise money for the kids, <laughs> why, why? Uh, yeah. especially coming out of the pandemic. So, uh, you know, we feel like we're getting to a, a safe spot now and we're looking forward to having the beer Olympics back. We've got titles to defend, Stu. We got to get back out there. Who is the uh, the reigning champ? Uh, so between Mike Jr., Braxton, and myself, we've we've kind of always had a fourth that's like the rotating free agent spot. Uh, I believe we won three out of the four years. So uh, <laughs> it's it's been since 2019. I don't remember who won in 19 if it was us or not. But like I said, we've got titles to defend, so we need to get back out there. Mike, you want that rotating spot? Listen, I don't know if I could handle that. I mean, now I did go down 17 and I did drink some fireballs out of the vat some guy had on the beach there and I was I was chugging beers, but man, I, I don't know if I can hang with the with the young folk who aren't so young anymore, you know, one of the in, in that tournament. We we can't hang either. So that's why we have it the morning before. It gives us a solid 30 of uh, 18 hours to, to recover. Check him out this year. Uh, not on an NFL field, unfortunately. He's retired, but I guess that's a good thing. Uh, check him out on NBC. He'll be calling games for the Big Ten. Uh, Kyle, we appreciate it. Final question on the way out. Jets, the New York Jets. Oh, God. Would you be more surprised if they made the Super Bowl or missed the playoffs? I would be more surprised if they missed the playoffs. Um, yes. I just I feel wow. like 
with the roster that they had prior to Aaron coming over, um, it, it's a borderline playoff team. And that was just basically with a really good defense and some skilled players on offense. And when you add a four-time MVP and Aaron, uh, the skill set that he has, I mean, we saw it a couple years ago with Tom going to Tampa. Uh, you know, Tom did it in a year where we didn't even have an off season. So Aaron has a head start on that. He was out there during OTAs and mini camp gaining a rapport with some of those young skill players. Uh, but then also just his familiarity with Nathaniel Hackett, uh, the, the quarterback coach in his room, Todd Downing is a guy that I played for here in Minnesota and has been under, you know, countless schemes with successful quarterbacks. So I just feel like they have all the right pieces in place and, uh, I would definitely be more surprised if they missed the playoffs. All right. You made two of the uh, the people on the Zoom very happy. One, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> one is very annoyed right now. Uh, Kyle, we appreciate it. Uh, since you have some free time, hopefully we'll be able to do more of this throughout the season, okay? Please, let me know any time. It's always a pleasure to be on with you guys, and I appreciate the opportunity. All right. I'll take Thanks, Kyle. Spot. I want to be the rotating guy, Beer Olympics. I'm in, okay? Yeah. <laughs> you got it. All right, done. <laughs> Check him out on NBC. He'll be calling games uh, for the Big Ten. Kyle, thank you, buddy. Thank you. Mikey A, like growing up, everyone has a house that all the friends, all your other friends want to go to. It's the house sure. for a number of reasons. And parents are never home. They're a little bit lax on the rules. They let you stay up later. They have good food. There's no locked liquor bar. There are several reasons as to why a particular house is the house when you're growing up. It seems like, just based off the conversation we had with Kyle Rudolph, that the Golick household was the house to stay at for Mike Golick Jr., Kyle Rudolph, and all the... Uh, and all Not the, surprising. Not surprising. Like, what do you imagine that experience to be like? Because I want to experience it. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it was... So all these guys, Kyle Rudolph and, and and that whole class, which was Mike's class. Yes. They come in and we got to know all the because Chris and I were there a lot, especially on game weekends, but even in the off season, we would go there as well. And, you know, as I had said, sometimes the parents can't come in as much. So we were kind of the de facto parent. We actually told the the, the all the kids, you know. Call us if you need anything, you know, uh, call us if you get your one phone call, you know, right, we'll, yes. we'll kind of be those parents and you're a, there, and you're responsible, right? Yes. yes. There's a, there was a condo development. Yeah. There was a condo development called Irish crossings that, uh, Chris and I bought a condo at when Mike was a freshman. So <clears throat> that's where we would stay, but obviously just on weekends. So all of a sudden, you know, all these freshmen are in dorms and, they would start to maybe one day a week go hang out at the condo. And then that turned to like two days a week. And then that turned into, well, let's bring some clothes over there just so we have them there to, oh, let's leave some toiletries there, you know, so when we go there, we don't have to just bring stuff. It'll already be there. And then basically, guys, they squatted in the condo. I mean, they just started living there. They just started staying there. And we would get there and we were like, damn, this looks pretty lived in. Because again, these are 18 year old boys who are about as irresponsible as can be. Um, they are, they, they wouldn't go out and buy toilet paper. They would take it from the, the, the team facility and just bring it home. Right. The trash to go out was 10 feet to take it. They wouldn't take the trash out. There was one time they would, instead of taking the trash out, they put up fly strips in the garage to catch the flies that were flying around the trash that they wouldn't friggin' take out. Right. So finally my wife and I were like, okay, you guys stay there. We're going to buy another condo right across the, the lake in the same development. That one is ours. You can never go in it never, but, and then you guys can live in this one. And the amount of between Mike, Jake and Sydney of their football players and when Sydney was there, other swimmers or soccer players or volleyball players that actually lived in that condo from the from 2008 to 2016 was unbelievable. And it was and actually it was it was a couple of players, Kyle being one of them, Kyle and, and, and another one and another uh, player 
who bought that first condo and they use it as an Airbnb. They rent it out. And right. I swear to God, when we were going to sell it awesome. to them, I thought we need to just pour bleach in this thing and burn it because I don't even want to know all the shit went on in there or what's going on in there. But we had to, we redid the inside of it and then sold it to them at market value. Yeah. And they've been, they've been renting it out. I love that Kyle Dude. probably had nothing to move in. Like everything was already there. All there. Everything was there. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, it's all right. Stu, I I picture Mike and his and his wife Christine walking into their condo, and there's some random backup football player sleeping on their bed, and he just wipes off Taco Bell wrappers. Like, oh, here, come on in, guys. Come Dude, that, in. That, uh, Mike, yay, that would be mild, mild to what went on in that condo, from <laughs> parties to to throwing up to whatever. Went on. May in I there. get the lady a beer, Bong? <laughs> and and we we know some of the stuff that went on there, but I'm I right. guarantee we don't know everything that went on there. But the amount of people that lived in that or stayed in that condo, that's why I swear we should have burnt the inside of it just to get rid of everything. Mikey, hey, we failed. Next time, get Kyle Rudolph on, not with Mike Gold Senior, with Mike Gold Junior. I want stories from oh. the house. Okay, here's My what wife we do. Said. Yes. We so, bring Mike on, we bring Senior on, but we don't turn on his video so he can hear all the stories and just yes. be there, yes. but they don't know that he's yes. there. <laughs> so my my wife said we should have set up a camera when the, when the guys took it over and just let it run, and we would have had one of the greatest reality TV things going on before reality TV became big. But, Mike, I think Mike EA is on to a good idea. If we have you in the Zoom, let those two tell the stories. They have no idea you're there. The big shocking reveal at the end is we turn your camera on. Okay. <laughs> we turn the camera on and Christine is there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, <laughs> she, she had a couple of blow ups in there for some of the stuff that went on. So there's right. there are some some classic stories. Believe me. Mike, we are less than 50 days away from the NFL season, and it's very exciting. Training camps are starting to open. The Jets open. Rookies are reporting. Uh, and I am wondering here, th there is a there's a big issue that I don't care whether it's outside the season, inside the season, this would be a fascinating topic to me. What are the running backs supposed to do here? Because this has become a big deal with Saquon Barkley and our buddy Austin Eckler, who joins us every week right. on God Bless Football. What would your advice be to running backs? Because they're being treated unfairly in a way that no other position is being treated. But there's nothing they can do. I know. I mean, I, mean, I, I have seen on Twitter everybody saying, you know, the union needs to, to do something for the running back, this and that. And I, th there, there are a lot of tentacles to this. First and foremost, the CBA runs another seven years. So there's not going to be any negotiation or renegotiation of anything going on there. Um, as far as what they're supposed to do, it, it's tough for me to sit there. The, the, the best leverage a player has is to take away their availability, right? Is to say, we are not going to play for you. And let's stick with Saquon Barkley. That's he is the giants offense. Yes. I'm surprised the giants didn't come up a little more because even if they gave him a really good deal, mm -hmm. their really good deals would be right around what tight ends are. Right. I mean, they're not approaching quarterbacks or edge rushers or cornerbacks or left tackles. They're nowhere near that money. So I'm surprised the Giants didn't up it a little bit to get them there. But, you know, everybody yells about the franchise tag. If people remember when the franchise tag came out, players loved it because all of a sudden they were guaranteed the average salary of the top five players at their position. And they're like, oh, my God, I'm guaranteed X millions of dollars. They love that. Then all of a sudden, it was like, well, wait a minute. That's for one year when we could be signing a multi-year deal. And instead of a number, in this case, of the running backs of $10 million, I'm guaranteed for one year, I could be signing a multi-year deal that has 20 to $30 million guaranteed. And they're not getting that. But that's in the CBA. That was negotiated. So there's nothing that they can do about it. And and I'll say this. And, and listen, I want every player to get paid, but understand a union's responsibility. It's to the players, but it's also to the majority of the players. So if all of a sudden they try to say when the CBA is up, they try and negotiate for one position or negotiate for a few players who are being tagged every year, 
What do you have to do in negotiation? If you're going to get something, you have to give up something. Now, is the union willing to give up something that hurts the other 1,750 players to appease the 50 players or 40 players or 30 players that this may affect? They're not going to do it, nor should they. And, and I know that's that sucks because the running back position has gone the wrong way in money, but that's, to me, the union is, is to help the majority. And if you have to negotiate for a few, you have to give up something for the many, and you right. don't really want to do that. So what Saquon Barkley and those guys what who didn't sign the tag? It's either don't play or play, make your $10 million, and see what happens next year. Here's the issue with, and I heard Saquon talking about this, and these guys might not show up till right around the first week, which is fine. You get out of training camp. That's cool. And say you don't play the first week, you can see what the team does without you. Now, also be careful of that. You had Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, uh, you know, a high pick for the Chiefs, all of a sudden getting beat out by a seventh rounder and Isaiah Pacheco. That's so, the problem right there, Mike. That's it, the problem. It, it, exactly right. So now the other thing is, if a player holds out, what what a lot of times happens to that player when they start playing? They get hurt. And now you're talking about a running back. A running back who's not taking hits early in camp, who's not getting in football shape, shows up at the end of camp and starts to play. Now, all of a sudden, you worry about a hamstring, about a quad, and God knows with Saquon Barkley, you got a lot of muscle in his legs. So now what if he gets hurt? Because he's been hurt in the past. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, dude, you want us to pay you, you're getting hurt. So it's it's tough. I think at the end of the day, he's going to play. He's going to make his $10 million. And and then we see what happens next year. Um, I and and I you just hope he doesn't get hurt. It's right now, it's a position that is in a bad, bad way, but there is nothing that, at least that I have seen or heard, nothing that could be done about it right now. Mike, it's crazy because growing up watching football, and you know this, the biggest stars in the game were the running backs. It was yep. Emmett Smith. It was yes. Marcus Allen. It was John Riggins. It was guys like that. It was Icky Woods, for crying out loud. Walter Payton. These are some of the greatest players we've ever seen. But the problem is, Mike, that when you, you know, Zeke Elliott goes down for a few weeks, you get similar, if not better, yep. production out of Tony Pollard. Exactly and right. So they're in such a tough spot. I actually feel bad for him. Oh, oh. Like if listen. I'm Kenneth Walker, I'd start sitting out right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. so in the marketplace, I feel bad for them. Obviously, fans aren't going to because if he plays, he makes $10 million, the running backs this year on the franchise tag. Right. And the people watching are never going to make that kind of money. So, you're not going to get a lot of people feeling sorry for you. But in the business that we talk about, and I understand this, their their market value has just has just crashed like the market. Correct. And I I I personally, Stu, I do not know what's going to get that back because you have more and more running uh quarterbacks who are running the ball extremely well. Yes. And that kind of takes away from the running back as well. And the so, passing game, Mike. Yeah. So yeah. it and it's a passing lead to go along with it. So right. it, it they're in a tough position right now. And I know a lot of them are complaining. And I would too if I was them. I'm always on the player side, but realistically, there is nothing that they can do. A real that they can control. The only thing they control is do I want to hold out? Do I want to say I'm not going to play? So say Saquon holds out the entire year. Le'Veon Bell tried that a few years back. It didn't work out too well. So you hold out so you don't get the year under your belt. And will the same thing, then you're rolling the dice next year. What are they going to do next year with you? And you didn't make $10 million this year. So it's it's tough decision. I have a feeling he's going to report at some point and play this year. All right. I want to discuss this. Le'Veon Bell did get paid though. So I want to discuss the He got paid, but he got hurt and he, he didn't and he was yet. done and, and he was done being one of the top backs in the league. Well, that's because he went to the Jets. Speaking well, of the Jets, I want to discuss them with you next. Golik, I'm very excited for our guy, Mikey A, because he has become, dare I say, a journalist, a writer. Uh, Mike, are you aware of this at all, that Mikey A is now, he's writing now. It's weird. Oh, no, no, I, I am. And I, I guess the biggest question I have for Mikey A is, as a Jet fan, do you ever start to write something positive and then by the end of it, it turns out to be all negative? <laughs> 
every day <laughs> pretty much every article starts with this <laughs> with this foundation of hope that just slowly trickles into just an f my life on the last sentence that's pretty much articles where i'm at like our seasons yes <laughs> oh god that's funny mikey promote it what's going on uh right now i got a piece out my top five players to watch on hard knocks not aaron Rodgers. uh i think makai becton is going to be really fun because he just might say the thing that gets him uh cut or traded out of new york <laughs> are you uh are you into hard knocks are you are you gonna be watching it i can't watch i can't i, can't. Uh, I, I love i've always watched the show um i found it really interesting that the jets didn't want it so bad that they they drew a line in the sand and mike i'd love to get your take on this they are not going to show the players getting cut which is always one of the big things that happens in the final episode you see who makes the team and who who doesn't but they do not want uh, cameras in the room while players are being told they're they're not making the team. Listen, these shows are better when you can show everything. And and I've kind of lost my luster for hard knocks over the last few years, though I did enjoy the Dan Campbell, you know, uh his personality. And and that's what that's what this is about. You know, is it going to be Aaron Rodgers? Is it going to be Sauce Gardner, Quinn and Williams? Who's going to be that personality? But you have to show everything. I mean, it's like the the quarterbacks, the Netflix uh, show about quarterbacks. You have to go behind the scenes. You have to do that. And listen, players get cut every year. I went through it. My son Mike went through it. Nobody likes it. Uh, you'd probably rather not have it on on film. But I mean, that's that's what makes shows I think better is when you give people full access. So I think, in my opinion, the show has already started to lose its luster, and now you're denying some of the access to it, so it really doesn't do anything for me anymore. They do have the right team. You mentioned that quarterback series on Netflix. Mikey, you haven't seen it yet? No, I haven't I haven't had a chance to watch that one yet. This is better than Hard Knocks. I mean, it is yeah. so well done. The first season is Mahomes, Marcus Mariota, right. and Kirk Cousins. They give you an elite. They give you a middle quarterback. They give you a guy who's trying to come back right. and, you know, resurgence, second opportunity and all that. Uh, I found myself, Mike, I don't know how much of this you've watched, but man, it really, really kind of opens your eyes as to what it takes to be an NFL quarterback, what they go through, how difficult that position is. And here's the most magical thing that show has done. They have made me like Kirk Cousins. It is yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> well, I mean, see, that that's, I think, the best thing about shows like this. And I have not been through the whole first season just yet, but I know it's going to have another season, but I'll get through it, is most people know athletes on game day. Now, you get a little more behind the curtain with social media, especially if a player and more players today are open, more open on social media or – trying to control their narrative more. We never had the ability to do that, but you can do it now. So you can do it a little more. But I, I, whenever you see someone, normally it's just on game day. Here you get a chance to see them off the field. You get a chance to see them preparing. You get a chance to see them with their families. They're human beings. They're, they're, that's the biggest thing I can say is they're not robots who just show up on Sundays. They're human beings with families, albeit well-paid and have great lives. But still, I mean, when especially when you have young kids, young kids don't care that dad, you know, is making 40 mil a year. It'll help them out later in life, but they want to see dad now. They want they want the father now. And and it, it's definitely I love when they do that and go behind the scenes. They also don't care that dad's body hurts. Like no, they, they, they do not. When dad gets home. Yep. It's <laughs> exactly right. And Kirk Cousins could barely move. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's very true. They they don't care. They just want to see dad. Right. And they want to play with dad. It's a it, that that's a cool thing. Uh, Mahomes is so fun to watch on the field. Of course, he's probably the best quarterback in the league. But did you realize he was such a trash talker, Mike? <laughs> no, no, I I didn't. You know, we found that out about Brady, right? Yeah. You know, if anybody got in Brady's grill and then he threw a touchdown pass, which normally he did, he was right back in their grill. Uh so that that that's something that hasn't changed. You know, quarterbacks certainly can get mouthy, and you might as well nowadays because you sure as hell ain't allowed to hit them. So they can get away with saying a whole lot more. Mikey, hey, watch it for just this reason. There's a Raiders defender who's just nagging Mahomes, and then Mahomes throws four touchdowns to Kelsey and gets in his face and said, you woke up the wrong mother pleeper. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's it. You are right. God bless football. God bless football.